Saudi Arabia. Now, it's very likely that when I tell you this word, you feel a feeling of unease, potentially some negativity, or even like, I don't know what to feel when you tell me this word, because there's been so much conflicting information about Saudi Arabia. But here I am, a 24-year-old social media manager who made the move from Australia to Saudi Arabia, fully. I am now officially a Saudi resident, and I'm here to work my first full-time year in the kingdom. Now, I am part of a very small group of people. I highly doubt that there is anyone my age commonly making this move, or people even coming all the way from the other side of the world, in Melbourne, Australia, to Saudi Arabia. So I'm gonna have to give you some backstory, because you're looking at someone who potentially, there's not much like him. And if there is, like if you are an Australian in Saudi Arabia, or if you are a 24 year old in Saudi Arabia, connect with me, because you know I'm looking for that sort of people that I can connect with too. But let's begin with point number one. So what am I doing in Saudi Arabia and why did I move not from a philosophical perspective, like why did I actually want to leave Australia and try Saudi Arabia, but like what's the reason? So I basically moved because I got a job here and a job that for me is not really like your nine to five job per se. It's a job that really embodies my mindset of work and life come together. Your life is your work, your work is your life. And it's not supposed to be like in a way where it's like your work is, I don't know, sending retirement payments to people over 65 and therefore it's your life. That's a something that at some point in the future can be fixed by AI. But even though I am a social media manager, also something that can be fixed by AI in the future, what I do is so much more than just write captions. I really make sure that the whole social media system is flowing internally and for our clients. And mainly the type of clients we work with are sports clients. So whether it's events, whether it's tournaments, whether it's bids for like a continental competition or even football teams, that's sort of the type of content that we work with. And using all the expertise that I've had creating content in the world of sports for over 12 years now, since I was like the young age of 13, this is, in my opinion, the right place to be. So that's from a job perspective, right? But what about from a location perspective? Australia and Saudi Arabia are two very different places. And I will say before anything, I did not leave Australia because I hate Australia, right? Um, I am Lebanese Australian. So I was born and bred in the United Arab Emirates and lived there my whole life. So I have some knowledge of the Middle East. But then at the age of 18, I moved to Australia, lived there for seven years. And so I always had this thing where, yes, I am an Australian citizen. Yes, I have family in Australia, but I never really felt at home. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm not your typical Aussie accent. And even Lebanese Australians usually talk like, yo, ka, yo, no, no, no. <laughs> They don't say, yo, uh, like, shoo baby, shoo kazi, go to IMG, yeah? Uh, obviously, I don't speak like that because I wasn't born and bred in Australia. Like, I came and from my international school in Dubai to Australia. So even in terms of accent, when people hear me, they always ask, where are you coming from? Not what area are you from? Usually in Australia, you see someone that's Australian, you go, what area are you from? So what area, what suburb? But no one's ever asked me, what area are you from? It's usually more like, where did you come from? What's your background? What's your ethnicity? Because obviously I don't sound like I was born and bred in Australia. But Australia, even though I do love it, it does come with its caveats. So one of the benefits about Australia is the beautiful nature right? The, 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 the beautiful lifestyle you've got there. It's very high standard of living, even to the point where when people do videos on like ghettos in Australia, like it's just a common inside knowledge thing that like the ghettos you see in America, the slums you see in different countries around the world, Australia barely has any of that. Like even the worst suburbs, I mean, obviously relative to the good suburbs in Australia are bad, but the worst suburbs relative to the worst suburbs around the world are very good. You know, the, most of the stuff there are fine. So in general, life in Australia is good. I'm not gonna use the word great or perfect. I mean good because when you look at Australia in terms of standard, it will always be a good seven to eight out of 10. It will never be a 10 out of 10 and it will never be a zero to three out of 10, but it will always be that good, acceptable, like it's there even though right now, you're maybe seeing a lot of videos about Australia. You're maybe hearing a lot of people from Australia saying they want to leave and the house prices and the immigration and all of the stuff that's happening in Australia. Yeah, fair enough. But still, relative to a lot of other places in the world, Australia is good. But one of the big issues, which is why Australia on a macroeconomic level is kind of struggling, is because of Australia's lack of innovation. You see, the Australian dream is to get a house. Every single person's goal, even your immigrants, right? The second and third generation immigrants now, they've sort of intertwined bringing their culture with the Australian culture, even them, even the Greeks, even the Lebanese, even the Italians, even the Sudanese. Everybody has that goal of like, yeah, I wanna have a house, and that's it. 
And sort of everything revolves around that goal and everything revolves around the daily life. So that's the main life goal, which is getting a house. And the daily life goal is sort of, as long as I'm making enough money and I can chill, have a beer, have a ciggy, have a whatever, you know, just chill on my porch and go out into nature, that's enough. And obviously, you have to add into the factor that there's not much cultural exchange coming into Australia. And I'm going to put an asterisk on that. It's so much harder to travel to and from Australia than any other places. Saudi Arabia right now, for example, we've got a break, which is a few days off. I can travel to 10, 20 different countries in a couple of hours for a very cheap price, right? But Australia, if I had a three-day holiday, right, I couldn't travel outside of Australia. It's, it's too much time, too much money, unable to do that. So that flow of ideas, that exchange of people, it's much slower, it's much more rare, and when it happens, it's more medium long-term, right? Here, you can get people coming here for three days, people leaving here for three days, but for Australia, rarely is anyone ever coming to Australia for three days or leaving Australia for three days if it's not New Zealand. So you get the point that I'm talking about there in terms of that switch and that flow and that exchange in cultures. And then you've got Saudi Arabia's bustling economy. One that's growing and all you hear is the money, the money, the money, the money, the money and the growth and this and football and events and, and the line and neon and all of that stuff that's going on. And it's like, wow, this country is growing at a pace that has never been seen in the world before. And I am simply interested in that. I'm simply interested in being part of history. Now, a lot of people will think, oh, you went there for the money. I'm kind of earning, especially relative to costs. I'm earning the same that I would be able to earn at a same level job in Australia. Like, it's, like money wasn't really a factor, right? Same wages, in Australia has quite high wages, right? So it's not like, oh, I was earning $2,000 a month and now I'm earning $8,000 a month. I'm earning the same that I would, more or less, give a few, take a few hundred dollars, maybe $1,000 maximum. So money is out of the question because evidently I'm not earning that much more exponentially. But you see, there is a big difference that I mentioned in Australia and Saudi Arabia. One is when you come for stability. And when I mean stability, I mean mental stability. Like no one comes to Australia to exert more energy. The reality is most people come back to Australia to be like, I'm coming back to, you know, just chill. And Australia, I think, is by far top five places in the world to do that. You know, on the other hand, in Saudi Arabia, you're coming to a place where there's so much movement, you barely even realize that you're missing out on sleep, you barely even realize that there's seven days in the week. And first of all, on a personal level, right? I've been, as I mentioned, doing content since I was the age of 12. I was always writing articles, reading things, doing freelance work, and ended up opening my first website that turned into an agency at the age of 15. So I've always had this mindset of I need to be working. And again, that work-life intertwining that's why it's important to me because my work was always my life. I was always doing things like journalism and football and sports and exploration. That was my work and that was also my life. And so for me, that's why they have to go hand in hand. But in Australia, I see it more as a separation, right? It's like, as and if you look at something like the Fair Work Act, which if you're not Australian, it's a way of ensuring that the, the working laws in Australia are great. Like if you work one minute past your working time, you get compensated. It's like very robust and very strong labor law that ensures that everyone has their rights, right? But it's a separation of work and life. And that means what you do at work is essentially you're saying, that's not me. I'm just doing that so that it can enable my rest life. I don't follow that mindset. I don't feel like I fall into that category of people. I feel like um, I need, like, I'll give you an example of what I mean by the work and life blending together. It's like, oh, um, on the 28th of June, I might be going to Uzbekistan to cover a lacrosse tournament for a week. And so within that, because I'm going for work to Uzbekistan, I'm going to also explore the nature in Uzbekistan and also do a bit of more exploration in terms of music and sports, things that I hold dear to my heart as a result of my work. And so work and life blend in together. And then another one is I'm planning to go to London from July 10th to 20th. And so I'm going there for a holiday, but I've also made sure that 
I'm also in a location where I connect with like-minded people in a working sense, which I've already set that up with. And so therefore my life, my vacation is linked with work. Now you might say, oh, you're always thinking about work, but it doesn't have to be work. You can meet those work people and just have conversations with them, go for a coffee. You're not physically doing work. You're more connecting and networking. And so therefore you see the blending of work and life balance. And so that is one of the main reasons that I left Australia is because I don't you know, fall in within that category or mindset. I think definitely when I'm at the age of 40, 50, 60, Australia is the best place to retire. But I don't think it's a place in my 20s that really fits my high level of energy. And I say that, and when I left Australia last month, right, it was one of the hardest things I could do in my life. Like, like just trying to let go of a place that I love so much was very hard, but also you have, I had to accept, like, it's just it's much harder for me to find that sort of work life intertwining here. And that's why I left Australia, but why Saudi Arabia? And now I want to touch upon the point I made where it's not just about money. And I explained my wage situation. And I think the main point that I want to touch upon here, which none of the media will focus on. And this is where I'm telling you something that the media will not tell you. Saudi Arabia is not just going through financial growth. It is going through creative growth. And now finances, it doesn't matter how much money you spend. You cannot guarantee success by just spending money. If you look at that from a sporting perspective, just because you spend on the best players doesn't mean you win. The players still have to perform. And so Saudi Arabia knows that. The whole goal of this is to spend money, to stimulate and to attract. And so therefore you build a system that can capture that and produce long-term gains. This money is short-term. This spending is short-term. They need to make returns. And so people are thinking, oh, the money's gonna run out. Yes, if you don't make any returns, the money is gonna run out. And contrary to what Western media can make you think, there is actual efforts by Saudi Arabia to ensure that this is not just a short-term bubble that ends, but one that significantly improves the human potential of international people and local people in Saudi Arabia. Just the amount of people they're bringing, the amount of CEOs from different sporting organizations and federations that I'm speaking to, both local and international, I clearly see that this is more than just money, right? It's very hard for you to believe. And I will not say that money has no factor. Absolutely not. Definitely money is an important one, but there, there needs to be an attracting factor, right? There needs to be an attracting factor, but also you, you, you have to understand that a lot of the people that are being offered high contracts in Saudi Arabia are already earning significant amounts of money. And so you have to understand that sometimes it's not just always about the money. When you're in your position, sometimes you could think, yeah, it is about the money. But, but realistically, there is so much more than just money because you can see some people who do come and leave for money. They don't enjoy the place because you came with the idea of money, but you forgot about your lifestyle, right? Money is only a tool. Money is only a tool. I'm talking about why I'm happy here. I'm telling you that my daily life, I'm so happy here. Even though it was one of the hardest things to do for me to leave Australia, I am so happy here every single day in Saudi because of the amount that I can explore, the people that I can connect with, the creative levels that I and people around me can reach. I think that that's so important. And yeah, I think people should understand that more because I don't think it's really a case of like, okay, you know, like in the end, if you don't think of Saudi in a good way, I mean, that's up to you. Like if you want to stay in your place, like again, it's your life. I'm just here to say, well, look, I'm 24, I'm Australian, I'm in a rare niche here in Saudi Arabia, but it's actually very entertaining. It's actually very eye-opening. I can learn a lot. I can grow a lot. I can be myself a lot. And this is contrary to what a lot of people have said about it in the media. Is there bad things that happen here? Yes, but it's irrelevant because every country in the world has bad things. If you're gonna compare the good things of a country to the bad things of Saudi Arabia, obviously the other country is gonna look better. But every single country has its good and bad. That's why I said nothing bad about Australia. I said it's more about why I don't fit in with the mindset of Australia and not because Australia is bad or I'm bad. It's a case of fitting in. But I do wanna say, that regardless of whether the project of Saudi Arabia succeeds or not, right, you have to think about it. Like you've set a goal so unprecedented that no one can achieve it, right? No one has achieved it, sorry. Now, 
let's say you've set a goal of making a billion dollars in your lifetime and you're currently making $1,000 a month. You've set a goal of $1 billion, but in the end, by the end of your lifetime, you've only made $123 million. Now, is that way off your $1 billion goal? Yes. But is it a failure? Not really, unless you're looking at it from the expectation of, oh, I have to reach the billion dollars. Reality is $123 million is so much better than $1,000, but because you've set your expectation on reaching the $1 billion goal, you consider it a failure. And that's the case here with Saudi Arabia. People think, oh, Saudi Arabia said that they want to reach X. They didn't reach X, they reached half of X, but half of X is still double what they were at before. And so it is a success. It is an improvement. It is growth. And if you've set such a massive goal, but reach 70% of that massive unprecedented goal that no one else has ever reached, well, you're bound to create new things and new experiences, new exchanges that people have never really experienced before. And I've decided that I want to contribute to that in one way or another. Saudi people have always been welcoming to me. I've been working with the culture for 11 years now. Something I should have said at the start of the video because people might tell me now that, oh, you don't know, you're just new to Saudi. I should have mentioned that before. But they've always been great to me. They've always accepted me, welcomed me, connected with me, respected me. Uh, and I just feel like if I can contribute in a good way back to them and we connect and interconnect, we can make the world a better place, all of us together. And uh, that's it for today's story.